This morning we're going to look at just two verses out of um, Mark chapter 14 and um, do it in a similar way that we looked at the first two verses of Mark 14, which is really giving to us a very bad example of things that are going on that are very sinful as our Lord Jesus Christ is being betrayed into the hands of wicked men in order that he might be crucified, uh, we know that that's the Lord's doing and that he was doing that in order to save many people without the crucifixion of Christ, without his betrayal to the Jews and to the Romans, we would not be saved. So we know this is a part of God's plan, but we also know that that doesn't exonerate these from doing what it is they're doing. What they're doing is incredibly evil. And the Lord was going to judge them for it. But again, recognize that that is the character of sin, which is why we should hate it so much. Not just the great sins of betraying Jesus Christ uh, into the hands of wicked men, but even the small sins, any of which are an infinite offense against God. We should hate all sin and turn from all sin. So let's look at this example in Mark chapter 14, verses 10 and 11. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. Again, we've heard this many times, we know this, this went on, but again, recognize the evil that is involved in this. Now, I do want to draw your attention to what we saw last time, and that is this, this you know, um, quarreling, as it were, the disciples were quarreling over the fact that a woman took a very precious uh, perfume, uh, this pure nard, and she, had, uh, she broke the container and poured it on the head of our Lord. They began to complain, Lord, this could have been sold for so much money. I mean, 300 denarii, that's a lot of money. Could have been given to the poor. And I think I also pointed out to you that uh, parallel account in John chapter 12, verse 6, points out that the one who was particularly perturbed by this was Judas. Judas was the one who carried the money sack for the apostles, or for Jesus, actually, for all of them. It was the common supply of money they had. And he would steal from that bag on a regular basis. So he wanted the 300 denarii I put into the bag so he could steal it. So he was put out by this. And likewise, of course, we saw in, in verses 1 and 2 in chapter 14 how the chief priests and, let's see, the chief priests and the scribes were also put out because they wanted to seize Jesus. They wanted to arrest Jesus and uh, secretly, though, so the people wouldn't see it, and put him to death. They were also put out because they couldn't find a way to do it. But now we see this morning an opportunity develops that actually resolves the issues for both of these men, for Judas and for the chief priests and the scribes, because Judas now goes to the chief priests in order to sell Jesus out. Okay, Judas gets what he wants, which is money. And the chief priests get what they want which is the opportunity secretly to arrest Jesus Christ in order that they might hand him over to the Romans for execution. And so after a deal is struck, we see that Judas begins looking for the right time to betray him. Now again, we understand this is the Lord's plan. We understand what he intends through this. We know that he is giving up his son in order to die for our sins. So this is a very important uh, uh, well, a very important action on the part of both Judas and the chief priests and scribes. But again, I want to draw your attention this morning to something here with regard to the character of sin, what sin is like. Now, notice that both Judas and the chief priests were willing to betray Jesus, Judas to the chief priests, the chief priests to the Romans, so that they both might gain something that they wanted more than Jesus Christ. And what is it? Well, it actually boils down to pleasure. Pleasure is the enemy of righteousness, at least if it's focused on the wrong things. Now, why do I say they are after pleasure? Well, think about this for a minute. What is it that Judas wanted out of the exchange? What was he after? Why did he keep sticking his hand in the money bag? It was because he wanted 
money. And what about the chief priests? Why do they want to kill Jesus? I mean, how can we say that that would bring them pleasure? Well, Judas wanted money in order to buy the things that most people want to buy who are greedy after money, things that bring them pleasure. And what, why were the chief priests wanting to hand Jesus over to the Roman authorities? Is it because they took delight in seeing people suffer and die? Not necessarily. But it's because they knew that Jesus threatened their position and their authority. Jesus was becoming increasingly popular. The hearts of the people were being drawn out after him. And if that continued, the Romans would come in and put an end to it. At the same time, Israel would lose their position as a nation before the Romans and the chief priests would lose all their affluence, all their authority, all of their clout with the people, and their comfortable living. So as a matter of fact, both Judas and the chief priests were willing to betray Jesus for the sake of their own personal pleasure. They wanted something more than him. Now one more thing I just want to note regarding this. I mean, let's consider who it is that is doing this, as, as we did before. I mean, who is Judas? Judas is a disciple. Judas is more than a disciple. Judas is actually numbered with the 12 apostles. This was one who actually went out and preached the gospel. This is somebody who went out and, and did miracles. This is somebody who heard the ministry of the Lord for three and a half years. He was one of Jesus' disciples, again, one of his apostles. And then consider who the chief priests are. These are the ones who actually led Israel in the worship of God. They were the ones who would make sacrifices on behalf of Israel, the ones who would pray to God on behalf of Israel. They were the ones who would minister God's word to God's people. They were the ministers of Israel. I only bring that to, or say that to point out that sin is found not only outside the church, sin is found inside the church, even among those who are numbered with our Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't think that I need to remind you this morning, although I think I already have, that it's found in those who are converted as well as the unconverted. This sin, this betrayal, this disloyalty for the sake of pleasure is actually in our hearts as it was in their hearts, although there is a difference, of course, we're going to want to see. But the fact that it's there means that we need to be careful. We need to watch our hearts and guard our hearts. Now this morning what I'd like to do is consider two things from this. First of all, what sin does. Sin moves us to betray Jesus, to be disloyal to him. But secondly, what we can do to fight against sin. Now first of all, let's consider what sin does. It moves us to betray Jesus. You know, there's a very simple definition of sin in Scripture by the Apostle John in his first letter. He says, sin is lawlessness. Sin is that which is opposed to God. It is opposed to his holiness, to his holy standard, to his law. Now, let's think about what that means. The Bible tells us that the law of God is actually fulfilled by one thing. And I hope you know what that is by now because we've placed a lot of emphasis on that. And that is love. Well, sin is opposed to the law. The law is fulfilled by love. So what is sin? Sin is actually hatred of what is good. It's the opposite of love. Okay? It is hatred of all that is good. It is hatred of God. It is hatred even of those who belong to him. Now, since this is what sin is like, it really shouldn't surprise us that it moves those who have it in their hearts to betray Jesus. Because Jesus is, after all, good. He is God in human flesh. He is perfectly holy. How is sin going to react to somebody who is perfectly holy? Well, it's going to betray him. Now, it's not going to betray him if you, if, you know, let's say the person perceives that Jesus is going the same direction they are. As long as they can walk together, that's fine. But as soon as Jesus stands in the way, as soon as following Jesus means that you have to give up something you want more, sin moves you then to betray him. So it shouldn't be any surprise to us that the chief priests 
well, I should say Judas, first of all, wanted to betray Jesus to the chief priest for 30 pieces of silver. That shouldn't surprise us because his heart was full of sin, darkness. So he gives Jesus over for something he wanted more. It shouldn't surprise us that the chief priests wanted to uh, arrest Jesus and denounce him to the Roman authorities so that he might be executed because Jesus was getting in their way. It shouldn't surprise us when we look all around us in society that we see all the evil that's going on that we do see going on because that is the nature of sin. These people do not have God's love in their hearts. And so they're not going to love what is right. They're only going to love what is pleasurable, what is convenient, what is fun, as they define fun. Again, remember the Bible says that sin is fun for a season. It does give a certain kind of pleasure, but the end of it is death. And that's the part, of course, we need to pay attention to. But the one thing we need to realize this morning is that the same disposition to betray Jesus Christ is in our hearts as well as in theirs. Now, thankfully, it's not exactly the same as it is with them. Because when the Lord saved us, he broke the power of sin in our hearts so that you and I actually do have a choice. We don't have to submit to sin, even though we are tempted by it. When you're confronted with a temptation, you have a choice whether to obey it or not obey it. You see, if the Lord hadn't given you his grace, you really wouldn't have a choice between whether to do what's right or what's wrong as far as what you wanted. It would be just a choice between different kinds of sins. And you'd be surprised how sin can sometimes be a motivation to do things that are at least outwardly good. Sometimes it looks like people who want only sin it looks like that they're choosing things that are good, but the reason they choose them are not good reasons. And so what they're doing is they're being motivated by sin to choose what is outwardly good. When you're unconverted, without God's grace, that's all you can do. But when God gives you his grace, he changes that. He breaks that power of sin in your heart so that you do have a choice now. Now, that doesn't mean that you're perfect. You know, perfection, the desire to choose only what is good and to hate everything that is evil, that perfection is reserved for heaven alone. It's only there that God is going to give you that perfect love and take all your sin away. While you're here on earth, you still have sin in your heart. And because you do, it's going continually to tempt you to betray Jesus. Now, I keep using this, this terminology, betraying Jesus Christ. I mean, how is it that we're betraying Jesus? What are we doing that is so bad? Well, every time we make a choice that is contrary or against what God wants us to do. Because there's something we want more, and that's always the reason why, we betray him. Not to the same degree that Judas betrayed him, not to the same degree that the, you know, the chief priest betrayed him, but we still do. And it's, it's you know, we, we can't say it's, it's a non-issue. It's still very serious. Now, the first commandment, you see, and all the commandments actually tell us, they actually teach us to do the exact opposite, to love God. That's to find our pleasure in Him. That's what the thrust of all the commandments are. When we seek our own pleasure, we break the commandments which actually teach us to do this. You know, I'm not sure if we've looked at the commandments in this way. We have. We've said that love fulfills them. But basically, how it's fulfilled is by finding pleasure in God. That's what the commandments teach us. The first commandment teaches us to find our pleasure in God most of all, to love him most of all with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. In other words, to delight in him more than anything. The rest of the commandments show us how we can do that, how we can do that in our worship of him, how we can do that in the promises we make both to him as we saw this morning and others of us have made the same promises or the promises we make to one another. How we can do it in our work and in our rest, in the way we relate to authority, in how we protect the lives, our own lives, as well as the lives of others, in how we keep our thoughts pure and the thoughts of others pure, in protecting what belongs to others, as well as what belongs to ourselves, in speaking truth about one another, 
and in being content with what the Lord chooses to give us. These are the ways we find pleasure in the Lord. But when we violate these principles, when we break these commandments, we're actually betraying the Lord, aren't we? Because we're giving up obedience to the one we love the most in order to gain something that ultimately resolves down to this. It's going to be more fun for me. There's something I'm hoping to gain that really has to do with personal pleasure. We're betraying Jesus when we do that in much the same way that Judas and the priests were because they betrayed Jesus for something they wanted more than Jesus that would enhance what they thought would enhance their pleasure. But we essentially do the same thing. Let me just, again, apply this, perhaps, or at least you give some examples of how we might do this. You know, one of the things that uh, you'll probably notice about uh, the worship service here, it's a little bit different than it is in a big megachurch. And some of those differences have to do with our music, our style of music, different elements that we allow into the worship service and so forth. And the reason why we do this is because we believe that this is what the Lord would have us to do. The worship service is to give glory and honor to Him and it's not to entertain people. So then, if you join yourself with a church that actually has the kind of worship that's more, uh, let's say, entertainment-oriented, why would you do that? Especially if you knew that God wanted something that reflected more the beauty of His holiness and truth and where we did just the things that God commands. Well, the only reason why we might do something like that is because we have more fun over there. It's more enjoyable. I don't know how many people I've talked to in my life who, when you ask them, well, how do you like that church? They say, well, I love that church. I love the worship. And what they mean by that is the music is great. I love the music. Well, I mean, music shouldn't be boring, but it shouldn't be overpowering. It shouldn't be just a matter of, um, of, of things that we do in order to draw people. The music we use should basically uh, underlie the lyrics or the words that we are lifting to the Lord. It should help us worship the Lord. It shouldn't just stir us up emotionally, it should stir our affections, but it's not meant to get us, you know, worked up the way that we often get worked up. I mean, because how do you, people, well, you know that people use music a lot as a stimulant. You know, they, they're plugged in all the time, they're listening because it kind of gives them, you know, the, the drive that they need to do things. It's, it's, it's like a, a drug. And churches can use music like a drug to draw people, but that's not why we use the music we use or why we should. We should do what we do to honor the Lord. Now, if you make a vow to the Lord, such as what you do in your membership vows, but you break them when it's no longer convenient to keep those vows, or let's say you make a promise to someone else, you promise to do something that, that's really good, that's really right, but then you don't keep that promise. I mean, why don't you do it except because of some pleasure. But when you do it, aren't you betraying Jesus? I mean, if you make a promise, doesn't he expect you to keep it? And when you make, take a vow before the Lord, that's something he does expect you to do. We only break those things because there's something else we want more, something that will give us greater pleasure. But in doing so, we betray Jesus. And again, the same thing with regard to all the commandments. If we decide instead of resting on the Lord's day, and instead of worshiping and fellowshipping with God's people, if we decide instead we're going to go to the beach or go to the amusement park or to the movies or to do anything other than what the Lord has told us He wants us to do on this day, again, haven't we been disloyal to Jesus? Haven't we betrayed Him for the sake of our pleasure? If we refuse to submit to authority within the church, or within the, the state, within the family, we do the same thing. When we do things, again, that are harmful to other people, either to ourselves or to others, if we commit sexual sins, or if we provoke immoral thoughts in one another because of the things we say, you know, some jokes that aren't, you know, that aren't appropriate, because of the way you act, acting in some provocative way. I mean, we know what that means. We've seen plenty of it around. Or even in the clothing you wear. Haven't we betrayed Jesus for the sake of our pleasure? We haven't been loyal to him because he wants us to do otherwise. If you take something that doesn't belong to you, even if you steal time for your employers by taking too long of a break, 
or if you say things about other people that aren't true to injure them or their reputation or to make yourself look better, if you're not happy with what the Lord has given to you or what he's decided to give to others, haven't you been disloyal to Jesus? And again, isn't the reason why we do these things, isn't the reason always boil down to this? Some kind of something we want, something that gives us pleasure is the reason why we betray him or we're disloyal. Self-pleasure outside of God's will is really the essence of sin. And this mirrors what Judas and the priests were actually doing. Now, I hope you can see how evil sin is because it betrays the Lord Jesus Christ for the sake of our own pleasure. So I hope we get a good idea of what it is, what it is they were doing, what it is that's in our hearts. I mean, isn't that in our hearts to do these things? Because we want something other than that that's going to make us, we think, happier. Now this brings us to the second point. What can we do about this? Because we all have this problem. What are we going to do about it? It's one thing to recognize that we have it. It's another thing to do something or you know, to be able to resolve the problem. Well, actually, I think the answer to the problem is as obvious as the problem itself. If we betray Jesus Christ, if we're disloyal to him for the sake of <coughs> some kind of pleasure that we want, somehow we need to find greater pleasure in submitting to him. We need to find our pleasure in the Lord and in the things of the Lord. Now, that is, in fact, what the Holy Spirit of God actually does when he converts us is he creates in our souls this new principle of love, this new desire that takes pleasure in the Lord. Basically, that's what love is, is a desire for something, something you know, a, a taking pleasure in something that actually moves your life into that direction. In this case, the Spirit of God gives us a love for the Lord and for the things of the Lord. Now, to keep from betraying Jesus because of the pleasure we find in not obeying him, we need to find a greater pleasure in obeying him. Now, how can we do this? Now, I think we can do it in a variety of ways. If we love Jesus Christ at all, these should certainly have weight with us. First of all, by understanding more fully what happens when we actually do betray Jesus in this way. And I think we've already seen that recently. When we are disloyal to the Lord, when we break his commandments, when we sin in, in any of those areas, we hurt ourselves, we hurt other people, and we dishonor God. We need to understand that that's true. When you sin against God, you do hurt yourself. Now, thankfully, you don't kill yourself uh, to the point, as it were, spiritually, where God kicks you out of his family. That doesn't happen, but you do hurt yourself in one way by bringing God's discipline down on you. Now, again, that's a good thing that he disciplines, not a bad thing, and we need to be thankful for it, but I think when we're going through it, we would all agree we'd rather not have to go through it than go through it, even though the end of it is good. God intends it for good, but it's not easy to go through. He disciplines you to get you on track. That's one way that it hurts you. And you, can, you know by, the, by just thinking about the other commandments, especially those that have to do with our neighbor, every time you do something to break one of those commandments, you are hurting yourself very often. If you break your promises, you know, it destroys your reputation. If you don't keep your covenant with the Lord, there could be discipline. When you disobey authority, I mean, you can in some cases be arrested. If you don't protect your life and take care of your health, you can get chronically ill. If you commit immorality, you, of course, can get a you know, myriad of diseases, but you can also end up with the responsibility of taking care of a child that's come out of that immoral responsibility. That is a big consequence. Obviously, if you steal from other people, there's legal consequences. If you lie about other people, it can come back on you. So you can hurt yourself, and you do hurt yourself, when you betray Jesus, that's one motive to not do so. But you can also hurt other people. Broken promises often do injure other people when they're counting on you 
to do something that you have agreed to do and you don't do it. You know, you let somebody down. It, it's not only inconvenient, but sometimes it can hurt somebody's finances or it can, you know, uh, it costs them. It, it costs somebody something when you break that commandment. Obviously, when you break the sixth commandment, regarding murdering other people or hurting them in any way, that, that can cost other people. Immorality is, is never committed alone. It's going to hurt the other person as well, not only tarnish their reputation, but again, it may end up leaving them with a child that they have to take care of. That's a big consequence. Talking about immoral things, acting in a provocative way, wearing sexually provocative clothing, of course, is going to inspire immoral thoughts in other people which are going to have consequences for them. Sin hurts other people. When you lie about other people, that hurts them as well. It injures their reputation. And of course, all of these things not only hurt you and hurt others, but they dishonor the Lord who delights in what is right and good and who hates evil. Now perhaps if we thought about these things more, if we cared about ourselves, if we cared about others, if we love the Lord at all, then it'll keep us from betraying Jesus because Jesus is trying to keep us from doing those things so that we don't end up, again, hurting ourselves, others, and dishonoring him. Now, the other thing we can do, or at least one other thing we can do to fortify ourselves against sin is to increase our love for God. I think that's something we know very well. The more you love God, the more you're going to want to do the things that please Him. And in the process, the more you're going to bring blessing to yourself and help yourself, and the more you're actually going to help other people. I mean, love, finding our pleasure in the Lord, is the key. So how can you love Him more than you do? Well, here's a couple of different ways. Think about how much He loves you. Think about what you were like apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about your sinful condition and, and how you hated your heart as well. Think about where you were headed to hell. And think about the fact that God gave his son in order to save you, his only begotten son, to obey for you and to die on the cross for you, to take God's wrath upon himself on the cross so that you could actually be set free from sin. Think about the love of the Father giving His Son. Think about the Son giving Himself for you in this way. Think about the Holy Spirit dwelling in your hearts, the love of God itself in your heart to stir you up to this love. If you think about these things, it can help you love the Lord more. Meditate on His love, which is infinite. Of course, you can use the means of grace more than you do. Read the Word of God. Listen to it preached. Receive what is being said. You know, as I'm saying these things, we're all having different responses to it. Some of us are listening and we're saying, amen, that's right, I'm going to do that, and maybe we're even making notes, okay? Others of you are like, well, I do that, or that's not important, or maybe you haven't even heard what I've said. But receive that word. If what is being communicated from the pulpit reflects what the Lord actually says in his word, then these are the words of Jesus Christ that are coming to you. You need to receive that. Pray in, in, in all things. Pray everywhere. Pray at all times. Seek the Lord for that love. Receive the sacraments. There are means to get more of this holy love. And as the author to the Hebrews reminds us, don't forget, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Do not forsake the fellowship of the saints because the Spirit of God is present. The gifts are in operation. Our love for one another encourages and inspires one another to love the Lord more. Use the means of grace more. And then finally, stop quenching that love you have by compromising with sin. The more you betray Jesus, the more you are disloyal to Jesus and give in to sin for your own personal carnal pleasure, the less you will desire the Lord and the things of the Lord. It is a vicious circle. The more we give in to those things, the less we'll love the Lord, but it can become a virtuous circle. 
by giving in to the things that the Lord wants us to do. It will build us up in love. So there are things that can be done. Recognize that that sin is still in your heart, even if you are a believer. Realize its character. It's evil. It hates what is right. It betrays Jesus. And it betrays him. I mean, it gives up basically infinite love and riches, of spiritual riches, for whatever that little pleasure may be that you're, that you're giving it up for. You're giving up you know, something of infinite value for something that is less than nothing, something that is negative value. Don't betray Jesus. That realize that it's there and realize there's something you can do about it. You can put that sin to death, and that's what the Lord calls us to do in these different ways. Now let me just close in saying this. That if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never come to him and received him as your Lord and Savior and rested on him and what he has done to save you from your sins, if you haven't done that, then you still have exactly the same kind of heart that Judas and the chief priests had. I mean, there's no difference between your heart and theirs. And you are not going to be able to keep yourselves from betraying the Lord Jesus Christ for these things that are infinitely less valuable and infinitely less important unless you first turn to him in faith and ask him to change your heart and to make you willing and able to do that. Now, if that's your situation this morning, this text calls you to come to him, to trust him to take away your sins and to give you a heart that takes pleasure in him so that you can begin to do the right things, which will actually end up in much greater treasure for you than the things that you keep betraying Jesus for. You know, you keep betraying Jesus, the Lord says you're actually accumulating for yourself a treasure of wrath. We wouldn't actually call it a treasure, would we? But it's all going to fall on you on that final day, and it's going to push you down into hell forever. You have to turn from that betrayal and trust in Jesus. And if you do, he will give you a heart that will take delight in him. And you'll begin storing up, as it were, a treasure that you will be able to keep forever in heaven, a treasure of perfect happiness, joy, and love in the presence of an infinitely loving being who is God and, of course, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So may the Lord help us then to fight against these things. And may he also give us grace that if we don't know him, that we might turn to him this morning and trust in him and be saved. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our hearts.